Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Tonight I want to preach to you a message titled, Identifying God's Temple. Won't you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your rich compassion that you have towards us. God, we could never thank you enough for what we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray for your anointing to touch my mouth this hour and my mind and my heart. I pray for all of us to be anointed by your Holy Spirit to understand what your word says to us this hour. And we say it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The temple of God is you. You who are in Christ, you are God's personal place of habitation. The temple of God. In the Old Testament era, David, King David of Israel, wanted to build God a house. This house would not be a house made out of necessity. God is omnipresent, which means that he's the only one who can say that he is truly everywhere all at once. God, to build God a single building of habitation at first seems to be unnecessary. Why build a home when all that exists is the home of its creator? But this house of God was not a building built out of necessity. It was a building built out of reverence. This house would reflect all that God is and all that God has. This house would be a glorious house. And it was a house that was to be respected mightily. David would not get to build this temple because he was a man of blood. God's will for David was to really be a tool of judgment against the Philistines. And God did not want a man of bloodshed to build the temple. But as, after David had died and his son Solomon becomes the king of Israel. And the greatest achievement that Solomon, the, the king, would ever get to have as king of Israel was overseeing the construction, overseeing the finished product of the temple of God. The very first permanent, well, I say permanent, the very first official house of God. Before there was the temple, there was the tabernacle. This place where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, the ultimate symbol of God's presence in the most sacred area in the heart of the tabernacle. In the Ark was the Ten Commandments and Aaron's Rod, the two most symbolic things of God's relationship with the nation of Israel, symbolic of the covenant between God and His people. In this Ark was the covenant. The image of the covenant between God and his people. Not just mankind in general, but between God and his people. And this ark was in the very heart of the tabernacle. What makes the temple and the tabernacle, tabernacle different was that the tabernacle was built more so for the sake of convenience. It was a portable house. Wherever the people of Israel would go, back in the days when they were in the wilderness, the tabernacle could be carried with them, and the pillar of God would come from the tabernacle, lead them as a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. But the temple was different. Whereas you could carry the tabernacle wherever it was that you went, you had to go to the temple. You had to make the decision to go to God when it came to the temple. God, in this case of the temple, was not your portable sword. 
but it was a source of strength that, that you had to make the decision to approach. You had to go to the temple. And the Bible says that whenever the temple was dedicated to God, it was a great celebration throughout the whole land. The glory of the Lord filled the house with the mist, the ministers, the priests could not even minister that hour because the glory of the Lord was so prominent in that house. People came from outside nations to this event just out of reverence for the God of Israel. And the temple of God, or as we would call it today, Solomon's temple, it was such a magnificent building because really this is the only building that's ever existed so far that you can honestly say was made exactly the way God wanted it to be made. I'm talking about every fork, every image on the wall, the materials, the perimeters, the area. The temple was exactly the way God wanted it to be. And by the time it was completed, it was seen as one of the great wonders of the ancient world. The outside was just layered with marble and layers of gold and incredible things. And the inside of the temple was layered with pure gold. The only area that nobody could go into was the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Because there was a veil that separated the presence of God from all of mankind. And this veil represents the sin barrier between God and man. There's a separation between God and humanity. And that separation is sin. And with the veil, only one Jewish man could go into the presence of God one day each year. And he would offer the sin offering to the Ark of the Covenant, to the Lord, which would cover the sins of the entire nation. And he had to do this exactly right. If he disrespected the sacrifice, God would take his life from him in the Holy of Holies. It required reverence to God. But the presence of God was cut off from all of humanity in the temple. In the 700s BC era, the Babylonian Empire invaded the city of Jerusalem, basically destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and in doing so destroyed the temple of God. And they probably destroyed the Ark of the Covenant as well. The last time the ark was publicly seen was all those years ago. All of it was lay, left in ruin when God sent the Babylonians to judge the nation of Judah, the southern nation of Judah, for their sins. It was all gone. But that doesn't mean that God is suddenly homeless because the temple was destroyed. As a matter of fact, God still has a temple. But this temple is not built with man's hands. This temple that we read about today is built solely by the power of the Holy Spirit. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died on that cross, he satisfied the demands of the law completely. He made peace between man and God. He took the sin of the world and the judgment of the sin of the world on himself. And in doing so, in having that sin judged on our behalf, there was now nothing separating mankind from the presence of God. Now, that veil that was in the temple, which in Jesus' time was not even the same temple that was built in the Old Testament, it was a larger, bloated replica of the original temple. But the veil still symbolized the same thing. And in Herod's temple, in the city of Jerusalem, that veil that they had set up on its own tore from the very top at the ceiling to the very bottom where it met the floor, symbolizing how now 
the sin barrier between God and man has been torn apart by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now, in the words of the Son of God himself, whosoever will may come, not just one Jewish man, one time a year, but wherever they are, whatever race they are, whatever ethnicity they are, whatever nationality they are, wherever they may be, whenever they want to, whosoever will may enter in. The Bible concludes with this word of invitation. Whosoever will, let them come and drink of the water of life freely. Whosoever, because the sin barrier has been destroyed. In this era that you and I live in, this new covenant era, the only way that you could be an alien to the kingdom of God was simply if you rejected him. Because there is nothing standing between you and God in the new covenant. There is no veil. There is perfect access. Jesus has busted the sin door down. You don't need to find a key because there is nothing to unlock. The door is open. Now in this new covenant, when you got saved, you received the Spirit of God. With the tabernacle, they had to carry God with them everywhere they went. With the temple, you had to make the decision to go where God was. But in this new covenant, God is simply with you wherever you go. You and I don't have the burden of carrying God. But instead, God carries us wherever we go and in everything that we do. Paul says here, don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know this? Don't you know that you are the temple of God? What does that mean, that I'm the temple of God? He explains that in that verse. The Spirit of God dwells in you. You are where the presence of God dwells. You are where God chooses to dwell. Don't you know this? He's talking to a church when he says this. A church who does not know this. This church at Corinth who are slipping back into immorality. They're disregarding things like communion. They're... They have a rather insane practice of the gifts. <clears throat> they, they don't know the mess that they're making of themselves at this church he's writing to. They don't know that the Spirit of God dwells in them. They don't know that they're without excuse to be indulging the sins that they're indulging as Christians. But because a Christian has no excuse... It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It just means that we have no excuse. When you have direct access to the power source to give you complete victory over all things, John Washington has no excuse in Christ. In the world, John Washington could have said, well, I'm lost. And there was that barrier that I saw to it was there. But in Christ, John Washington has no excuse because that barrier is not even there anymore. And I'm not having to struggle. I'm not having to search a landfill for some key to unlock the deep things of God. Jesus busted that door down for me 2,000 years ago. I don't have this excuse. So whenever I fail, whenever I sin, I still repent and God still gives me grace. Because he never changes. But don't you know that everything that we battle with, everything that we let keep us down, every time that Satan attacks us and we let him attack us, every time we let Satan or the world put us under their heel, don't you know that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Don't you know that 
that you are the temple of God. Solomon's temple was made exactly the way God wanted it to be. Exactly the way God wanted it to be. God revealed what the temple would be like to David. And by the time Solomon was king, it was his time to put up this building. And this temple, this house of God, was supposed to be, it had to be, exactly the way that God wanted it to be. Because if it's not exactly the way God wants it to be, it's not of God. It's of man. With you, God wants you to be exactly the way that he wants you to be. You follow me? You and I are in a process. We call it the sanctification process. And when we fail in this process, we don't lose our salvation because we fail. I'm just saying God has a mission in your life, and that mission is to conform you completely into the image of His Son. To conform you into His image. And His image is the image of His Son. In other words, God wants you to be as Christ-like as Jesus is. God doesn't want you to be as Christ-like as you can be. Many people in the world today are kind. Many people in the world today are patient and long-suffering. There are people right now who, if they were to drop dead, they could not say that they went to hell because of lying, because they've never told a lie a day in their life. There are positive attributes that you can gain in the world. A worldly person can be honest. A worldly person can be patient. A worldly person just might have a clean mouth. It does not mean that they're like Jesus. Because to be like Jesus is to be like Jesus plus zero. And God wants you to be like Jesus plus zero. God's mission in your life is to make you just as much like Jesus as Jesus is. Anything less than that, God will not accept. And it doesn't mean that God is waiting on Ed Mahan or Janet Mahan to hurry up and be like Jesus because even though they've accepted Christ, they could go to hell if they're not just like Jesus tomorrow. That's not what it means. It means that God has a will for their life, he has a will for your life, for y'all's life, Brother Ray. He has a will for your life, your life, our lives, and that will is the same. God's will is to make you into the image, the spitting image of Jesus Christ. This is the temple that he's building. He's not turning you into a building like this one that we're in. He's turning you into somebody else. He's taken away that old man, crucifying that old man, putting that old man to death, and he is bringing to life a new man, and this new man is a byproduct of the saving power of the blood, and it has this new man has nothing to show for himself other than what Jesus has to show. This is the temple of God. That God wants. And he says, don't you know this? Don't you know that you are the place, not where God has to habitate. Because God doesn't have to move in to anybody. Like God is obligated to do anything. No, he isn't. But God chooses to habitate in this vessel, God chooses this vessel. The moment I said yes to Jesus, God moves into this vessel. And not only does God move into this vessel, but God chooses to stay in this vessel. Now, when God first moved into the vessel, 
It was as though God moved into one of those run-down shacks out there in the woods that you could sell for $5 in this economy of ours, which is saying a lot. It was as though God moved into one of those shacks where there are bugs in the couch, there are bugs in the bed, there are bugs in the fridge, there are bugs in the bugs, they're everywhere. And whereas most people would have just burned this house down, God understood that this house was bought and paid for for a big price. And God understands this better than anyone because he's the one that paid the price. He's going to turn this vessel into a house that lives up to the price that it was purchased for or purchased with, however you want to put it. God is going to turn this house into something that lives up to the standard of the price that was paid for it. Because if God leaves this vessel as nothing but a shack with the bugs, with the price that he paid for it, not only is it not going to make sense, but this shack is going to die off anyways one day. But God, now having claim to this property, God is going to tear down the old house with his name still being on the property. And in its place, God is going to put something that is just as glorious as the price was that was paid for it. God paid a high price, so he's going to replace this old, run-down, insect-infested home with something of his worth. Something of his standard. Now this varies from person to person. One thing that the Lord kind of ministered to me a few months ago about sanctification, because that's still the main theme of this book. When Paul asks the question, don't you know that you are the temple of God? He says all of this with the sanctification of the believer in mind. And the Lord said something to me about sanctification a few months ago that has stuck with me because there are so many people who talk about sanctification today in the church, and it seems like sometimes nobody can make up their mind. Just a couple days ago, I saw a video on social media. Some guy was talking about how people who talk about the victorious Christian living should shut up because, you know, Christianity is a, it's a bunch of suffering. You know, your flesh is going to suffer. And he told everyone who goes on about victorious Christian living to be quiet because, you know, he wants to suffer. And apparently there's a whole camp out there who believe like this that only those who suffer the most are really the ones who are godly because they're, they're, really, they're willing to put it on the line for King Jesus. Paul said in Romans 7, thanks be to God who gives us the suffering? No. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So don't let anyone ever tell you you don't have the victory. God says you have the victory, so walk in the victory. Accept the sufferings of Christ and walk in the victory that he's afforded to you. And God said something about sanctification to me because you do hear that a lot. Christians, saved people, love to talk about every now and then how miserable the process can be. Let me tell you why the process can be miserable if it is miserable for you. And it's been miserable for me before, and the Lord has had to show me some things about myself. Sanctification can only be as miserable as the Christian is hesitant to let sinful desires go. Whenever God reaches into your life and wants to pry something away from you, but you hold on to it, yeah, that is miserable. The more hesitant I am to let the flesh go, you better believe the more miserable this process is going to be. Like God, in His infinite wisdom and in His infinite mercy, is going to look at me hanging on to something that does not please him. And like God is going to say, you know what, he doesn't want to let go of that. So not only will I leave it there, I'll let it enter into heaven, right? 
No. If God has to get a knife and cut this thing out of my grip, he's going to do it. And he does that because he loves me. He loves you. He loves you a lot more than he loves your sin. All right? He is not going to let you and me stay attached to the things that he hates. And love us to a fault where he has become ignorant of what displeases him. The last person you know who's ignorant of anything is God. So whenever God moves into this shack in the woods and he looks at the damage, he sees the cobwebs, he sees the bugs, and his solution is to tear the place down. And for most Christians, that tear down is a chip, a chipping process. It's not where God brings in a tractor, wraps a whole chain around the building, and just drives the tractor and pulls the building down in one swoop because of how hesitant we can be. And often this doesn't include things like murderous intent. Normally it's things like petty anger. Normally it's things like jealousy. Normally it's things like the urge to gossip. Normally it's things to simply justify ourselves in situations where we were not justified because of those things right there. For most Christians, this teardown process so that the temple of God can be in its place is a chipping process. God has to remove the little things one chip at a time and praise God for his long suffering. Most of us, it's a chipping process. And actually, I've never known a Christian who can say truly that it was just one big pull down and then God fixed everything right then and there. My mother has talked about it, how she battled with cigarette addiction, tobacco bondage for two years after she got saved. And that was something that over time the Lord had to work on her of. He will work on you over time. I'm just saying sanctification is only as miserable as we are hesitant to give things to God. The more attached I want to be to my sin, the more miserable sanctification will be. But the more desperate I am for the Lord's glory to fill this vessel, the more resistant I become to the desire to sin. In other words, the more accepting I am of the Spirit's influence in my life, the more embracive I am of the power of the Spirit in my life, and the victory that was purchased for me 2,000 years ago, the more accepting I am of these things that God gives me. Paul said in Romans 7, He gives us the victory. He doesn't test us for it. He freely gives it to us. And the more ready I am to accept what He offers. Sanctification does not have to be miserable. Let me tell you guys something. I had to get surgery last year. I had my wisdom teeth, all of them, taken out one swoop. And I didn't know until then, but that's like a legitimate surgery. It's not just another visit to the dentist. And let me tell you all something. Some surgeries you're just better off having. Some surgeries in life you can't wait to get them over with. Even if there's a recovery process. Even when you need time to adjust to the way your body is now after the procedure. But there are some things in life you just can't wait to let go of because of the pain that these things cause you. All right? And whenever the surgery is over, you might have to take time to adjust to what there now is, to the way things now are. But it does not mean that I wanted to have those wisdom teeth in my mouth any longer than they were, okay? Even if I had to have Jacob Cox come preach that next morning because I could barely open my mouth, I don't care. They were gone, praise the Lord. There are some things that you and I both, spiritually speaking, we cannot, we could not wait to just let go and give to God already. And whenever he took these things from us, the last thing we felt was misery. Like I was saying goodbye to an old friend. Goodbye, lust. Like, come on. No. No. Sanctification is only as miserable 
as the believer makes it out to be. And the believer makes it miserable whenever we choose to hold on to things that God is trying to pull away. And that's a decision that we make. It's not that God sets us up to become bound by these things. That's not God's decision. You want to know what God's decision was for your life before the foundation of the world? God's decision was to destroy the sin in your life by way of the cross. That's God's decision, and God has made his decision. God's made his decision. What's my decision? What's my decision? I have to make a decision now. And that we know what the decision should be. The decision ought to be to submit to this process that God has me in. Submit to the changing power of the Holy Spirit. Honor Jesus Christ in light of what he's done for me so that I could have this access. Have faith in the finished work of Christ to conform me into his image. We know that that's the right thing to do. And yet Paul is here talking to an entire church of people who don't know that. Don't you know? Don't you know that the cure for all sin, past, present, and future, is living on the inside of you? Don't you know that God is not going to live in a place built by man's hands, but he wants to live in a place molded and shaped by his hands. And that place is you. That place is you. He says, don't you know this? Don't you know that God chooses to live in you? Don't you know that God chooses to change you? Don't you know that God chooses to heal you? Don't you know that the reason why God does these things that he does? Don't you know that it's not because he's contractually obligated to you as though you're his master but don't you know that God has compassion on those who've done nothing for him? Don't you know? Don't you know that you are the temple of God and you are his temple because he's chosen you to be his temple? God gives you this identity. He does not distance himself from a saved person. He does not distance himself from those Christians who are even failing. Paul is talking to failing Christians when he says this. He says, don't you know this? That the Spirit of God dwells in you. Why? Because even though the Corinthians are deep in their struggle right now, at the end of the day, they're just as saved as Paul ever has been. And because of that, the Spirit of the Lord dwells in them. How they handle that is up to them. How they adjust with that process, with this process, is up to them. But God is not struggling with figuring out whether or not any of his people should be his place of habitation. God is no respecter of persons. And to those who are failing, to those who choose to fail as a child of God, and you know what I'm talking about, Paul says, don't you know that God is right there with you? Don't you know this? So what is the temple of God? It's a vessel that belongs to Jesus Christ and it's becoming exactly what God wants it to be. And if God has to chip this building down one day at a time, you better believe he'll do it. I mean, it's God's time, God's earth. What is God losing if he has to chip slowly? What is God losing? Nothing. 
But what do I lose whenever I choose to struggle against, against this flow? What am I losing? What time am I losing? What opportunities am I losing whenever I choose to resist the sanctifying power of the Spirit of God? Don't you know? Everybody in this building right now, myself included, has a golden opportunity since the moment you got saved to be a beacon of righteousness. Everyone in this building, it doesn't mean that we're sinlessly perfect, but everyone in this building has a chance every day to mirror the righteousness of Christ. The people out there, they can see that there is a God. They can see that God's Son is just as much alive today as He was 2,000 years ago and before that. And they can see that through me. They can see that through you. Everybody in this building has a chance to honor God and to show the world the power of God. My father, who's not here this evening because he's home with mom, I've uh, been praying for him too, having to deal with all of this. Sometime about a couple years after he got saved, maybe a year and a half, he was in Walmart in Newport. And he, I'm assuming it was an old friend of his, he walks by one of his old friends, and they stopped and they had a short exchange of conversation, and his friend said to him, he said, John, well, I don't know, you just seem different, you just seem different, now, what's happened? And my dad looked at him and he said, oh, you know, it's, it's the Lord, the Lord is just working on me, and glory to God. And my dad went out back out to the car where my mom was waiting and he explained the situation to her and he asked her, he told her what he said. He said, oh, you know, it's the Lord. And he asked her, he said, was that the right answer? And she said, 100% that was the right answer. Because it was the Lord. Because the Lord builds the house. Amen.